Okay, what month are we in? Elul. And what's our Torah portion? Shoftim. We're going to look at what that means here in just a little bit. But because we're now in the month of Elul, and this is one of the most significant months in all of world history, you want to know why? Genesis 1-1 began in the month of Elul. All right? And let me silence my phone. Anyone else has phones, they can silence them too. I've got, there's rockets going off in Israel. That's what the noise is. Okay, look at this picture here. You see a field. We have lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah. What does it mean when we say the king is in the field? The, one of the questions is, are, do we want to encounter him? If you remember in Revelation, some people are hiding in the caves in the rocks. The last thing they want to do is encounter the king. Well, this Torah portion about judgment always begins in the month of Elul. So the month of Elul is known as the month of repentance. Everyone needs to repent. The field is the world. In the Gospels, Yeshua says his field is the world. And what happens in his field? We see there are wheat and tares, all right? And they need to be separated. This is the month Yeshua walks through the world, his field, and he's looking to see how many wheat, how many tares, what is the condition. So the other thing he's looking for, how can you tell the difference between wheat and a tear? How do you know? The tear is always perpendicular, but the wheat has fruit or grain, and it bows. It bows before the king, bearing fruit. The tares are prideful. They always stand erect. And I got this off the internet. It says, wheat's evil twin has been intoxicating humans for centuries. It's known, tear, its more technical name, is known as Darnell. It is poisonous, but in small enough doses, it can give people a special kick, like a lot of other things that they get that are grown to get a special <laughs> kick from. Okay, but the big difference is the wheat bears fruit, and they bow. The tares never bear fruit. And what is the Lord always coming to look for? Fruit. One of the interesting things, that word darnell... Uh, in Latin, it's tamulatum, and it means drunk, to be drunk. Uh, one of the plant's effects is messing with a person's vision. They can't see clearly what's going on, and it affects their speech. Now, on your notes, we have Matthew 13, 24 and 25. Here, Yeshua puts a parable before them, and he says, the Kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds or tares among the wheat and left. Well, look at Matthew 13, 29 and 30. It goes on. And he said, when the angels basically said, what, do you want us to rip them out? And he says, no. Lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Then he says, let both of them grow together until the harvest. And then in the time of the harvest, I will tell the reapers, gather together first. What? You gather the tares, not the wheat. You gather the tares First, you bind them in bundles to do what to them? Burn them. And then he says, but gather the wheat and put it into my barn. Where is God's barn? Where's God's barn? He's got a barn. Well, do you remember the Temple Mount was the threshing floor of Ornan and the Jebusite before it became the Temple Mount? It was a threshing floor. Okay. So look at John 12. 23 and 24, Yeshua said, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain or a kernel of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. 
But if it dies, what does it do? Okay, we know you have to plant watermelon seed or whatever seed. If it's just a seed in a packet, it's not going anywhere. But if you plant it in the earth, it resurrects and bears fruit. But what this tells us is that the only way you can bear much fruit is if you die. We have to die to ourselves. If we don't, if we're all total narcissists and we think everything in the world is all about me or all about us, we're not going to bear fruit. We have to die to ourselves before we can bear fruit. This is why in John 15, verse 5 and 6, Yeshua says, I'm divine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and lets me abide in him, he it is that does what? Our goal in, people ask, why am I here? Why did God create me? What's my purpose in life? I can tell you, to bear fruit, to be alive and to bear fruit. But the key is not for your glory, it's to bear fruit for his glory. He says, apart from me, you can't do anything. If anyone doesn't abide in me, what has happens to them? They're thrown away like a branch and the branches are gathered thrown into the fire, and burned. That's what we just got done reading. So he's talking about the wheat and the tares. It's those who aren't producing fruit to glorify him and those who aren't producing any fruit. Let's look at John 15, verse 8 through 10. It goes on and says, Herein is my Father glorified. You notice Yeshua never wanted to glorify himself. He always wanted to glorify the Father. And he says, my father is glorified when you bear much fruit. I mean, think about this from a natural perspective, a business perspective, whatever kind of just natural perspective. The person who has done, created something or done something, created an art piece or whatever it may be, they're the ones who get glorified when the art piece is produced okay, or the business owner. Well, here God, what happens if it, nothing that he creates produces fruit? He's not a very good God. He's not a very good builder. He's got some problems. Okay, this is why Satan wants to not have the glory of God, so he does everything to destroy you. So when you are presented to God, it's like, oh my goodness, look what God did with that one. Are you following me? So, look at this. It says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you, so continue in my love. Then he says, if you keep my commandments, then you will abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. The way the Father is glorified is if we do what he says. How many of you, have ever seen parents in the store telling their kids to do something and they don't do it? How many have ever seen this happen and the parents all frustrated? Or maybe there's a boss at work that tells employees to do something and they refuse to his face. What does that tell you about this whole situation? Well, this is why we want to obey, not out of fear of punishment, not out of hope of reward, but because we want to make sure that everyone, when they see us, they'll glorify God. Like when people see the grandkids, okay, and they're all behaving, hey man, those parents and those grandparents have been doing a good job. So, look at Matthew now, 13, 36 through 38. Yeshua sends the multitude away. He goes into a house and the disciples come to him and they say, declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. And he answers and he said to them, he that sows the good seed is me and the field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. Okay, so only one is bearing fruit. Now, when it says the children of the wicked one, it doesn't mean literal, like some people think. It just means 
you know, that's what the fruit is that's produced by these actions. So here's the other thing that is mind-blowing. If you look at 1 John 2, 18 and 19, he says, children, it's the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, guess what? Many of them have already come and gone. And he says, therefore, we know that we are living in the last hour. But here's the key. Where did these antichrists come from? They went out from among us. But they were not of us. If they had been of us, they would have continued within us or with us. So it's fascinating when people try to decide who the antichrist is or whatever, the tares and the wheat go together. Okay, the Antichrist could very well come out of the church. That's what we need to realize. Look at Matthew 7, 19 through 24. The Lord says, every tree that doesn't bring forth good fruit is cut down. So not only do you have to bear fruit, you have to bear good fruit. And then it is cast into the fire. And then it says, it's by their fruits you will know them. Not, not, and now this next part is so crazy. Not everyone who calls me Lord or says Lord, Lord is going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. It's the one who does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now many people say, well, I'm going to only do what Yeshua says, not what the Father says. Well, Yeshua only does what the Father says. Now this is scary. Many will say to me in that day, O oh Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? And in your name, we've cast out devils. And in your name, we've done many wonderful works. And Yeshua says, then I'm going to profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that are doing works of iniquity. What? How can prophesying in his name, casting out devils in his name, doing many wonderful works in his name be iniquity? How does that work? Now, let me ask you this. How many Muslims cast out demons in Jesus' name? How many Jews cast out demons in Jesus' name? Who's he talking to? <laughs> okay. There are, uh, well, let me, and here's the other thing. Where in the Bible is the commandment that you have to prophesy? Is one of the commandments that you have to cast out demons? There is no command. So why are they doing all the things necessarily? They're not works that God wanted done. They're works that we wanted to do. But the big problem is why they're called iniquity is because people do them for them to get the glory. I want to prophesy so everyone has to come to me because I have the word of God. And say so they try to build up their own little prophetic kingdom. And so everyone depends on them to hear from God. Or they do all kinds of wonderful works. It's more like name dropping is what they're doing. They're not doing it uh, because God told them to do it. They do it because they want attention. So anyone who prophesies in Jesus' name, does wonderful works in Jesus' name, cast out demons in Jesus' name, those are all good things. But if you're doing it to glorify yourself and not your Father in heaven, that is bad fruit. Okay, now, in Deuteronomy 18, verse 20, concerning the prophet, it says, but the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name. That's what happens even today. A lot of people presume to speak a word in his name, and then what happens? Wow, it says, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. I'll never forget. Those of you, some of you know my history, some of you don't, but I was raised Catholic for 19 years. Then I was in the Pentecostal movement for 19 years. And then ever since then, I was uh, following this type of a thing. But I'll never forget, you know, here it's talking about those who presume to speak a word in his name. Uh, I, well, one of the first Pentecostal churches I went to, and I'm not against the gifts of the Spirit. I'm not against the fruit of the Spirit. I'm not against any of it. But I think it ha most of it is done in the flesh, not in the Spirit. 
But I'll never forget this one, and I'm only like 21 years old or something. So this was a long time ago. And this one guy, they had mics. This is back in the 70s. They were all moving in the spirit, and they had microphones on either side. The people would come up and prophesy, and they would come up and do tongues, and someone would come up and interpret and all that. And this one person came up, thus saith the Lord, and he went on and he sits down and someone comes up to the other mic, thus saith the Lord, that was not me, saith the Lord. Then all of a sudden that guy comes back up, thus saith the Lord, this is to me, saith your God, you know, and I'm like, I'm ducking, you know, I'm out of here. But um, it's, you know, but anyway, this is what's scary about people who take speaking God's word lightly or presumably. I like to speak God's words, but it's his word out of the Bible. Now, what's interesting is in the Song of Songs that we'll be covering here in a couple of weeks, chapter 7, 11 through 12, here she finally learns her lesson and she says, come my beloved, let us go where? Into the fields. Let's lodge in the villages. Let's get up early to the vineyards and see whether the vines have budded, whether the great blossoms have opened and the pomegranates are in bloom, and that is where I'll give you my love. You're going to find out today, the second half, when I teach about the Song of Songs as we go into this. Uh, and as you know, the whole book is about the bride is always falling asleep. And here she finally gets up, works the field. Now, interestingly, the book uh, or the... Torah portion of Judges always occurs in the first week of Elul, which is the month we are to judge ourselves and prepare in earnest for the days of judgment starting on Rosh Hashanah. So let's take a look here at our Torah portion. And this is Shoftim. Can everyone see the word Shoftim? The Shin, uh, that's the P8 sound, the T and the final Mem. Shoftim. That's what that word is. But let's take a look at the root words. To understand Hebrew, there's always root words, and then things are built around it. So, for example, a judge is a shafat. And you make it plural, we would add an S, but in Hebrew, you add the mem. And so here, this is the word shoftim, which changes from judge to judges. And then... So here you have judges, you add the letter mem, and you get mishpatim, which is judgments. And a judge is one who gives judgments. But you can see it's all built around one word. What is the responsibility of a biblical judge? How many of you know you have a lot of different fonts on your computer? Okay, Hebrew, over the millennia, the fonts have changed. Here is what it looked like in Moses' day when he wrote the word shafat. Here is the shin, and the shin represents teeth, and it means to bite, to consume. So these are like fangs. And then the ph is the mouth. The pay means to speak or words. And the tet is the circle with an x, and the tet represents the serpent. So what does a judge do? He destroys the mouth of the serpent. That's what a biblical judge is to do. And then it says in our Torah portion, you're to assign judges and officers. Okay? Judges and officers. An officer is a shelter. And what does he do? This is the race is ahead. So the officer is the one who destroys the serpent's head. And that's what we do. We stomp on the head of the serpent. But I want you to see in the Hebrew language, it is so pictorial in the ancient font, you can literally look at it and see what the word meant. Does that make sense? Okay, so. And it also talks about true prophets and false prophets. It also talks about, this Torah portion talks about unintended manslaughter, blood vengeance, cities of refuge, even cold cases. You ever watch those TV shows about cold cases, forensic files or something like that, trying to find out a cold case? Well, it talks about that in the Torah portion. 
And it, is, it talks about the good, the bad, and the ugly, and it's all under the heading. The main heading or thought of this Torah portion is justice, justice is what you are to pursue. We're to pursue justice. Is justice truly being pursued today or even handedly? Or is there always politics involved? That's the problem. Today, we're not pursuing true justice anywhere. It's always politics. Now, look at Deuteronomy. Here it is, 16, 18. Judges and officers shall you make you. Now, that doesn't make sense in English. Well, Hebrew is in English. What this is saying is you have to make for yourselves a judge and an officer. Okay, why did the Torah add the word for yourself? Because it is an obligation upon everyone to police our own behavior. If we don't police our own behavior, the police will take care of our uh, behavior. Uh, as you know, it goes in and it talks about that all your gates. Well, guess what? We have an eye gate. We have an ear gate. Are we policing what we're seeing? Are we policing what we're hearing? Have we, are we putting guards? Or are we just letting the whole garbage... Are we, a, are we a human garbage disposal? That's what we become. We become human garbage disposal. And we just allow all kinds of garbage to come in rather than guarding our eye gate, ear gate, mouth gate. Now, Rosh Hashanah is coming. And so this month of Elul is how are we doing at policing ourselves? Because in a month's time, we're all going to be judged. And that's why it says it's better that you fall on the rock than the rock falls on you. So we need to make sure how we're doing before the rock comes. Look at Genesis 18, 25. Abraham says to God, shall not the judge of all the earth do what's right? And look at Deuteronomy 32, 36. It's the Lord himself that is going to judge his people. In Acts 10, 40 through 42, it talks about how the father raised up Yeshua the third day, gave him to be revealed not to everyone, but to witness uh, who were chosen before God to us, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to proclaim to people and to testify that this is the one who's appointed by God as the judge of the living and the dead. So Yeshua is the one who's going to judge the living and the dead, as it says in 2 Timothy 4, 8. From now on, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me at that day, and not to me only, but to all them who love his appearing. Many people, the wicked, are not loving his appearing. I look at Deuteronomy 16, 19. Since we're talking about judgment, it says, you shall not rest judgment. You shall not respect people. You shall not take a gift, for a gift blinds the eyes of the wise and perverts the words of the righteous. Okay, it's like someone here, hey, let me hand you a bag of money. And right now, what is going on? And Netanyahu's situation, they're complaining because they say he's taken gifts. And you hear of Supreme Court judges who have taken gifts. There's all kinds of politicians that love to receive gifts. But the problem is, we know when you receive a gift, they expect a favor out of you. Nothing is free. And, but here's the thing. If you say, well, I'm not under the law. Judges couldn't take bribes. He didn't say me, so I could take a bribe because I'm not under the law. No. You look at the principle, and we have to understand what the principle is all about. But look what happens in 1 Samuel 8.1. It came to pass, Samuel, who is the high priest, basically, he made his sons judges over Israel. But look what it says in verse 3 and 5. His sons didn't walk in his ways. They turned aside after money, and they took care of the priesthood. They're taking bribes. It's, it's kind of like selling indulgences in the Catholic Church. Okay, they perverted judgment. And then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together. They came to Samuel, to Ramah, and they said to him, Behold, you are old. Your sons don't walk in your way, so make us a king to judge us like all the nations. 
This is just broke God's heart completely. But look what he has right here. In Deuteronomy 16, 20, I have two different translations. One of them says, justice, justice shall you follow. But the other one says, righteousness, righteousness are you to pursue. What's the difference between following and pursuing? I mean, you think of someone in this store and someone's behind them following them. But what if they were pursuing them? And now they're running after them. They're chasing. We don't follow after righteousness. We chase after righteousness. If you are running in one direction, how much harder is it to get you to stop and go the other direction? The problem is we don't pursue righteousness. We just do, do, do and then we get distracted, and then we go the other way. It takes a lot more to stop a moving train. This is why God wants us to run after and to chase righteousness. It makes a huge difference. So I have here justice equals righteousness. Actually, it's the same thing. Now, here, this is what God told everyone to do. When you get there, I want you to tear down their altars, dash in pieces their pillars, burn their asherim with fire, chop down their carved images of their gods, and destroy their name out of that place. Right? That's what they were to do as soon as they got there. In Deuteronomy 16, 21 and 22, you will not plant an asherah of any kind of tree beside the altar of the Lord. This is an asherah pole right here. And he says, don't you dare put any of these in the temple by the altar of the Lord. Okay, don't set up a pillar. And then in Deuteronomy 17, it talks about this. I have the stars, the sun, the moon, the heavens. And it says in Deuteronomy 17, two through five, look guys, if there's found among you any within any of your towns that the Lord your God is giving you, a man or woman who does evil in the sight of the Lord your God, transgresses the covenant, they've gone and served other gods and worshiped them, such as the sun, the moon, the host of heaven, which I have forbidden, and then you hear about it, then you have to inquire diligently, okay? You have to inquire diligently. You can't just believe the fake news. And he says, if it is true and, and certain that such an abomination has been done in Israel, you're to bring out to your gates that man or woman who's done this evil thing, and you shall do what? Stone them. Stone them. All right. Let's go to 2 Kings for a minute and look at chapter 23. This is King Josiah, and this is about 300 some years after King Solomon. And it says, King Josiah commanded Hilkiah the high priest and the priests of the second order and the keepers of the threshold to bring out of the temple of the Lord. So these things were in the temple. All the vessels made for Baal, for the Asherah that he forbade, and for all the host of heaven that he forbade. They literally took those things, put them in the temple area itself. And so he takes them out. He burns them outside Jerusalem in the fields of Kidron, carried their ashes to Bethel. He deposes all the Baal priests whom the kings of Judah had ordained to make offerings in the high places. Wow. At the cities of Judah and around Jerusalem, also those who burned incense to Baal. They're in the temple burning incense to Baal. And then it says to the sun and the moon and the constellation and all the hosts of heaven. In the temple itself, they were worshiping all of these things. And then they brought out the Asherah from the house of the Lord. God said, don't you put this anywhere near it. And they have it inside. To the brook Kidron, they burned it at the brook Kidron. They beat it to dust, cast dust of it upon the graves of the common people. And then it says, he broke down the houses of the male cult prostitutes who were in the house of the Lord. Male prostitutes in the house of the Lord, where the women wove hangings for the Asherah. Do you see how bad it's gotten? Well, look how bad the church has gotten. There's so many woke churches and everything else going on. But here's what is mind-blowing and then it goes on and it says that Josiah defiled the high places that were east of Jerusalem, that's the Mount of Olives, to the south, and now they call it the Mount of Corruption, which Solomon, the king of Israel, had built for Ashtoreth, the abomination of the Sidonians, for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. 
and he broke in pieces the pillars and cut down the Asherim. Okay? Solomon is the one who started all of this. How can we think Solomon is so great and wise when he's the one that initiated all of these things? That's why in Deuteronomy 17, 16 and 17, it says only he, that which is the king, he's not to multiply horses, cause the people to return to Egypt to the end that he may multiply horses because the Lord said, don't go back that way. Neither is he to, to multiply wives so his heart doesn't turn away. Neither will he multiply to himself silver and gold, which is exactly what Solomon did. He became an arms merchant. Look at 1 Kings 10, 28 and 29. Solomon had horses brought out of Egypt, linen yard. The king's merchants received the linen yard at a price. A chariot came up and went out of Egypt for 600 shekels of silver, a horse for 150. And so look what Solomon did. For the, all the kings of the terrorists, Hittites means the terrorists, for the kings of Syria did they bring them out. Solomon was an arms trader, an arms merchant selling weapons to the enemy. And then in our Torah portion, Deuteronomy 17, 18 and 19, it says, when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he has to write a copy of the law in a book out of which is before the priest. He has to carry it with him and read all the days of his life so he can learn to fear the Lord his God and to keep all the words of this Torah. Well, how many of you believe Yeshua, like it says on the cross, he was the king of the Jews, right? Well, if he's the king of the Jews, then the laws that pertain to Jewish, Jewish kings apply to him, okay? Even the Messiah is not above the rule of the law. No one is above God's Torah because no one is above God. So his word always has the final authority, and even kings cannot transgress it. If they do, the Torah is reduced to simply good advice, and the commandments become the suggestions. And then in Deuteronomy 18 of our Torah portion, it says, There should not be found among you anyone that makes his son or daughter pass through the fire, which is what Solomon did. Deuteronomy 19, 16 through 21. If a malicious witness arises to accuse a person of wrongdoing, then both parties to the dispute appear before the Lord, the priest, the judges, and the judges have to inquire diligently. And if a witness is a false witness and accused their brother falsely, guess what? You get to do to them as he had wanted to do to his brother. And that's how you purge evil from your midst. This is why when all the men brought the adulterous woman and they said, you know, what are we supposed to do? Moses says to kill them. Well, guess what? It says in the Torah, you're to bring both the man and the woman. And it says they were caught in the very act. They weren't bringing the man. Hmm. So we see some false accusations. So Messiah is diligently inquiring and they all leave because they know they're in trouble. Okay. All right. There's another verse. In Deuteronomy 20, 1 through 4, when you go to war against your enemies... And you see an army much bigger than you. Don't be afraid because the Lord, your God, is going with you who brought you out of Egypt when you draw near to the battle. And this is happening right now in Israel. When they draw near to the battle, priests are coming forward and speaking to them and saying, Hear, O Israel, today you are drawing near for battle against your enemies. Don't let your heart be faint. Don't fear. Don't panic. Don't be in dread because the Lord, your God, is going to go before you to fight for you against your enemies. And then lastly, Deuteronomy 21, 1 and 2, it says, if in the land your God has given you to possess, someone is found slain. Here we have that unsolved murder, forensic files. And they're lying in the open country, and it's not known who killed them. Then your elders and your judges have to come out, and they will measure the distance to their surrounding cities, and it goes on. But all of this verse here has to do with the story of the Good Samaritan. Because in the story of the Good Samaritan, the man who's died is near Jericho, okay? That is 20 miles downhill from Jerusalem at the temple. Jericho was a Levitical city. Who wants to walk 20 miles back up hill if someone is found dead and they touch a dead person? Well, when the priest that had come down and the Levite, when he had come all the way to Jericho, they see this guy that's lying half dead. Wow. They realize if they go and help him and he actually dies, they got to climb 20 miles back uphill and get the ashes of the red heifer put on. This is why they're avoiding 
the man who was probably from their city and they don't even realize it. All right, with that said, let's stand. We'll take a break, come back, have a little bit of worship, and then we'll t- go back to the Song of Songs. Avinu Mokeno, our Father our King, we just thank you for all of those around the United States, around the world, those that are here locally, that want to be a light, take the light of your Torah to all the nations of the world to give us a good understanding of what you're saying, that we would both be willing and do of your good pleasure. We thank you for all of those uh, who bring any tithes or offerings to your ministry. This isn't ours. This is yours. And we just want to magnify the Torah, make it honorable once again. And we want people to honor you, to magnify you, and see what a good, good father you are. And they're going to see that by looking at your kids and how they behave. So, Father, we want to behave so that you can get all of the glory. In Yeshua's name, amen. Together, blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit. Through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua, you alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break. Are you ready? Here we go. Now, we are in Acts chapter, or Act 2, which starts with chapter 2, verse 8, and goes through chapter 3, verse 5. Here's the shepherd is calling, but here she is. She is sleeping. She is sound asleep. How many of you know we all love to sleep? But there was a mistranslation in your King James Bible. I'll go back to that. In Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 7, the bridegroom is speaking to the daughters of Jerusalem. And it says, by the rose or by the hinds of the field, stir not up nor awake my love until she please. Most Bibles say he please. Uh, But the Young's literal translation says, she please. And when you know Hebrew, you realize she's the one who fell asleep. And when you know English, you see that's common sense with the next verses. But she's the one who fell asleep. How many of you realize the church also has been asleep for a long time? So now the Shulamite, the bride, is waking up. And look at what she says. In the Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, she goes, it's the voice of my beloved. Remember, he always calls her my love. She always calls him my beloved. And she says, the voice of my beloved, behold, he is coming, leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. My beloved is like a roe or a young heart. (gasps) Behold. He's now standing right behind our wall. He's looking in the windows. Oh, he's showing himself through the lattice. He's getting closer. So here we see he's like a young buck. And here he is. He's looking through the lattice. Okay. And what is he doing? He's coming. He's coming. Let's watch. Now the shepherd is speaking and he says to her, Hey, honey, (laughs) the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. You didn't sleep one night. You went into hibernation. (laughs) This isn't someone who slept one night. You slept all winter. You've missed the rain. You've missed the blessings. Okay, he says, look, the flower is over and gone. The rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of the singing of birds has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. Okay, again, we have to stop and think. What time of year is this? Which is Passover. These are tied into the festivals. And my goodness, she missed all of the winter rains. As a matter of fact, the rains always speak of blessings. Look at Ezekiel 34, 26. God says, I will make them 
and the places all around my hill a blessing. I will send down the showers in their season, and they will be showers of blessing. So the rain always speaks of blessing. Okay, now, let me see. Okay, I'm going to skip a verse. We're going to come back to that. Oh, here, here I am. Let me go back up here a second. Okay. Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Here she says, Behold, he's standing behind our wall. Do you know what the Hebrew word for wall is? This is called the Western Wall. It's called the Kotel. And the Kotel is what they call the Western Wall. And that's the word here. Okay. <clears throat> and... The rains, just like you see here, I don't know if you can see it very well, but the rains always speak of blessings. Now, look what he says in Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 10. It says, my beloved spoke and said to me, what? Get up. So who was sleeping? She was. This is why you see the King James translation is completely wrong because she's the one who was sleeping. And he says, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. And then he says, okay, the winter's past, the rain is over and gone. Now take a look at this. This is actual rain in Israel. All the rain comes in January, February, March, and this is what she's missed. She's waking up around Passover. Now you'll notice the rains, Israel's a desert. The latitude is the same as Scottsdale, Phoenix, Arizona, okay? Okay. And here's where the rains begin at Sukkot. They always pray for rain and the rains begin to increase. But the big rains, he just got done saying, you've missed all the rains. You missed it. You missed all of the blessings. And then look at Jeremiah 8, 7. Even the stork in the heavens knows her appointed times. And the turtle dove, the swallow, the crane, keep the time of their coming. But my people are clueless. Okay, the birds know when to migrate. The butterflies know when to migrate. The whales know when to migrate. Okay, the salmon know when to migrate. But he's saying the appointed times, the Moedim, Passover, Sukkot, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur. He says, but my people don't know the appointed times. He says, look, even the stork knows when it's time. All right? They know the appointed times. Now, look at this. In chapter 2, verse 13, what is he telling her? The fig tree puts forth her green figs. The vines with the tender grape give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. So we see again, she is the one who was sleeping. But look at this in Proverbs 10, verse 5. Whoever gathers in summer is a wise son, but he that sleeps in harvest is a son that causes shame. And I believe much of the church does that. They say they're supposed to know the times and the seasons, but they don't know the times and the seasons. Most of them don't realize this is the month of repentance. Every month has its own time and season. And one of these days, I'll put out a, a little pamphlet that says every month what the time and what the season is for that month. But look at Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 14. What is he saying? He calls her a dove. And he says, oh, my dove, you that are in the cleft of the rock. So I got a little dove here in the clefts of a rock, in the secret places of the stairs. Let me see your face. Let me hear your voice, for sweet is your voice, and your countenance is comely. Do you realize what is happening in this chapter? She goes, I hear him coming, his voice skipping among the mountains. Oh, he's close. He's looking through the window now. So I need to go run and hide so he won't see me and put me to work. <laughs> That's why she's hiding in the secret places of the stairs. She saw him coming and goes, I'm out of here. 
So she is hiding. Here she is, hiding. He's looking in through the lattice. Where are you, dear? Oh, and she's hiding behind the stairs. Oh, no, he's going to put me to work. And so look at this. Here we see now. I think it's... Um, um, oh, I went the wrong way. Okay, so here now, look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 8 and 9. Here comes the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the evening wind. And the man and his wife went where? A secret place. They went into hiding, okay, from uh, the voice of the Lord. They're hiding in the trees away from the eyes of the Lord. And the voice of the Lord comes to sing, where are you? As if he doesn't know. Okay. Well, look at this. In Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 20 and 24, the anger of the Lord will not return until he has executed and he has performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days, you're going to consider it perfectly. We're living in the latter days, and we're going to consider perfectly what the thoughts of the Lord's heart are. And it says, I haven't sent any of these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they're prophesying. If they had just stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, then they would have turned from their evil way and from their evil doings. Am I a God at hand, says the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can anyone hide themselves in secret places that I won't see them, saith the Lord? Don't I fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? So here, just like in Genesis, the body of Messiah doesn't want to go to work, and they're hiding in secret places, and God says, I still see you. <laughs> now, we know Israel is the vine. Isaiah 5 talks all about that. And in Psalms 80, look at verse 9, 8 and 9, it says, You took a vine out of Egypt. That's Israel. You drove out the nations and you planted it in their own land. You made ready a place for it that it might take deep root and it sent out its branches over all the land. So that's what God did. Just like Adam was not created from in the garden, he was created outside of the garden and then put in the garden. Here we have Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel, and he takes the vine out of Egypt and then he plants it into the promised land for them to spread out. Now, look at Psalm 80. It continues to say in verse 14 and 15, come back, O God of armies from heaven. Wow. Let your eyes be turned to this particular vine and give your mind to it even to the tree which was planted by your right hand and to the branch which you made strong for yourself. So the whole thing is the vine has to cooperate with the vine dresser. Now, listen to what the shepherd says. Here, now picture it, he's outside of the house. Okay, the bride represents the church or Israel, whatever you want to think, but she doesn't want to do the work. She wants to stay within the four walls, okay? And she's hiding from him. And so he says, here's what we need to do. Look at this picture. I love this little picture. And he says this. We need to take the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. It's just, it's just like a, they're just being born. They're tender. They're small. Now, when the Bible says this, take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, what does that mean? See, most people read it and, and they say, oh, it's a nice little story. The, don't let the fox spoil the vine. Okay, well, here is when you let Scripture interpret itself instead of you trying to come up with some ridiculous allegory. Who is the vine? Okay. A fox is destroying the vine that God wants to take care of. Look at Ezekiel 13, verse 3 and 4. Thus says the Lord God, Woe to the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit. They see nothing. O Israel, your prophets are the foxes in the deserts. What is spoiling Israel? It's the false prophets. They let the Bible tell you the false prophets are the foxes that are spoiling the nation of Israel. 
Do you see how easy it is to let it interpret when it interprets itself? As a matter of fact, look at Jeremiah 23, 25 through 28. God says, I've heard what these prophets have said, and they, look at this, they prophesy lies where? Wow, remember what we just read earlier in the Gospels? They're prophesying in his name, but they're prophesying lies. They're prophesying what comes out of their own heart. They're not prophesying what he told them to prophesy. This is why it's called wicked works. I wanted to wait for this time to tell you about that. But do you understand? The Lord's prophets are prophesying lies. They're not prophesying what he told them to say. And this is why the body of Messiah, even today, is having problems. It says, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart, which think to cause my people to forget my name. They want their name to be known. They forget God's name by their dreams, which they tell every man to his neighbor as their fathers have forgotten my name for Baal. And this is the problem that's going on in the body of Messiah today. Okay, now many of you are familiar with this next phrase. Now the Shulamite is responding. Now remember, here he comes, he's all excited. He's heard he's coming. He's looking through the wall and she goes and runs behind the stairs and he says, hey, come out. I want to see you. I want to hear your voice. So what does he finally get to hear her say? She finally speaks and she goes, my beloved is mine and I am his. In other words, you belong to me before I belong to you. My beloved is mine. Oh, and then I'm his. And you're going to see this phrase evolve throughout the chapter as she, or throughout the book as she matures. And she's so proud of herself. She goes, he feeds among the lilies. If you remember in chapter one, she says, where do you feed your flock? I have a clue. I'm clueless. But now she's learned a little bit about him. So she thinks she's got it down. I know he's feeding among the lilies. And then look at what she says. Go away or turn, my beloved, and be like a roe or a young heart upon the mountains of Bether. Bether means separation, just like the Cascades separate eastern Washington from western Washington. <clears throat> so I've, I've got here this <clears throat> beautiful little field in the mountains, and I want you to think of the mountains as being a separation from one side to the other. And if you look here, let me, oh, nope, go back. Nope, go back, go back, back. Ah! Okay. <clears throat> Let's see. Oh, yep, yeah, I'm right here. Okay, there. Here's Jerusalem up here in the corner. The mountains of Bether or Betar, here is the Betar Alit, here is Betar. And so there's Jerusalem. But look at this. The mountains here is what separates east from west. And this is exactly where the 1949 Armistice Agreement line was, separating, you know, Palestine from Israel. But the mountains of Betar means mountains of separation. So what she is saying, oh, my beloved, why don't you go take a hike? Why don't you go be strong? You go be this really cool shepherd. Why don't you go run to the other side? Uh, I, personally, I need to get some more sleep. So you go take a hike. I'm going to sit here and rest. You go do what you need to do. Okay. So what do we see happens? She's saying, you do your thing. I want to stay within the four walls of the church or the temple or whatever. She claims to be in the driver's seat in this relationship. She has little knowledge of him, but like I said, she remembers from Song of Songs, chapter one, verse seven, when she says, tell me, oh, who my soul loves, where you feed, where you make your flock to rest at noon. Here she claims to love him, doesn't know where he works, and she only wants to know when the flocks are at rest, so she wants to come at lunchtime. She doesn't want to help with the work, okay? In other words, she thinks, Oh, look, I know where you feed. Uh, if I need you, I'll call you. I'll text you. Okay, hon? 
you know, oh, shepherd boy, I need you now. It's all about me. Okay, I know where you feed now, so I'm safe in the walls. You go do whatever you need to do. All right, so look at what the Shulamite now says. He leaves just like she wanted. And she says, by night on my bed, I sought him whom my soul loves. I sought him, but I found him not. Okay, let's stop for a minute. If you remember last week, it was, look, our rafters are fur. Our cedars, you know, uh, I mean, our uh, houses of cedar, our rafters are of fur, and our bed is green. It's now my bed, my house, my cedars. It's, it's on my bed. You know, I can just see her looking for him. She's searching everywhere. Where did he go? Where did he go? You know, she's got her hand out. Well, he's gone. She thought that he would come back, you know, and it's all good. She could have been out all night working with him, being with her beloved. Instead, now she's home alone. And look what it says. I went to look for him. I couldn't find him. So she says, okay, I'll get up now. And I'll go about the city and the streets, and in the broadways I will seek him. Does that ring a bell? The broadways. Broad is the way of destruction. She's totally looking in all the wrong places. And she says, I will seek whom my soul loves. I sought him, but I found him not. Several times she looks for him, but she can't find him. She claims to love him, but she wants nothing to do with him. She wants to be the one that tells him where to go, tells him what to do, and she just wants to rest. I can just see her searching under the covers. Is he there? Where'd he go? And so she could have been with the shepherd had she listened to his voice, but now she's searching at night in the dark, and guess what? That's where predators are looking, lurking. Okay, so let's look at Hosea. Hosea is one of the main books that tie in to the Song of Songs. And in Hosea chapter 5, verse 5 and 6, it says, The pride of Israel testifies to their face. Therefore shall Israel and Ephraim fall in their iniquity. Judah's going to fall with them, and they will go with their flocks and their herds to seek the Lord, but they shall not find him. He has withdrawn himself from them. So many believers think they can forget God, and then when they need him, He'll appear, but guess what? They think when they call God, he will come. That is only based if when he calls and you come. God is calling, and the speed with which we answer his call is the same speed he'll answer when we call. And here, they have their flocks, they have their herds, and they're searching for him, and they can't find him. This is why... Isaiah 55, 6, seek the Lord while he may be found, call upon him while he is near. This is why we have the biblical calendar that starts this Rosh Hashanah, so you know the appointed times. There literally are times when he is not near. So you have to call upon him when he is near. And guess what? We're in the month of Elul. This is when he's near. He's in the field. So literally, this is why you need to be on God's calendar that we produce so that you know what time it is. Look at Jeremiah. This is chapter 29, verse 12 and 14. Then you will call upon me. You're going to go and you're even going to pray to me and I will hearken to you and you're going to seek me and you're going to find me when? When you search for me with all your heart. And I will be found if you, says the Lord. I will turn away your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations, from all the places that I've driven you, says the Lord. I will bring you again to the place where I've caused you to be carried away captive. That's Jerusalem. That's what's happened the last 2,000 years. And this prophecy was fulfilled. They've all been brought back. But the key is we have to seek the Lord with all of our heart. How often do we want something if someone else will get it for us? (laughs) We don't want to get up and get it. Hey, but would you get that for me? Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 15. The Lord is with you if you're with him. And if you seek him, he will be found of you. But if you forsake him, he's going to forsake you. 
Now, for a long season, Israel has been without the true God, without a teaching priest, without the Torah. But when they in their trouble did turn to the Lord God of Israel and sought him, he was found of them. Do you realize that's a prophecy right now? It's been 2,000 years that they've been without the teaching priests, without the Torah, without the true God. They've come back as a nation, and now they're starting to turn back to him. Ezekiel says they'll come back to him as uh, the heathen, basically, or in unbelief, which is what happened in 48. They were mostly communist Zionists. Uh, but now God is beginning to turn their hearts. Now, here, the Shudamite is speaking. And look what she says. The watchmen that go about the city found me, to whom I said, have you seen whom my soul loves? And then what happens? Immediately after, she says she loves him to someone else. She's not just speaking to herself. She's now out in the open. She says, it was but a little while that I passed from them, but I found him whom my soul loves. Why? Because he's finally confessing him to others. And she finds him and she says, so I held him and I wouldn't let him go until I brought him to mom's house into the chamber of her that conceived me. So the moment she publicly professes her love for the shepherd, she finds him. But what happens? She goes back to sleep. <laughs> Look at Song of Solomon 3, 5. Again, the shepherd says, this is, she's exhausted after her all night search. And the shepherd says, I charge your daughters to Jerusalem by the rows and by the hinds of the field. Do not stir up nor awake my love until she please. Now the King James says he please, but it's wrong. So we are now entering, drum roll, brum, 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 act chapter three, which is chapter three, verse six to chapter five, verse two. Her search begins again and she falls asleep again. So what do we find here? The daughters of Jerusalem are now speaking in verse 6. I got a little picture here. Here's the daughters of Jerusalem. And they see this huge parade in the middle of the night going on. And look at what the daughters of Jerusalem say. Who is this that comes out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke? Now notice it's not a cloud this is smoke that burns the eyes, that burn the ears. It wasn't the pillar of cloud like the Messiah had in the desert. And it says, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense and all the powders of the merchant. This is at night. This is King Solomon on the hunt for prey. He's not feeding the sheep. He is feeding on the sheep. Watch what happens. Solomon is coming out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke. The Hebrew word here for smoke is ashan, and it implies anger. The phrase pillars of smoke is the same phrase we find in Joel chapter 2, verse 30. God says, I will show wonders in the heavens, in the earth, blood and fire, and pillars of smoke. This isn't like the cloud in the desert. This is fury. This is anger. Look at Psalms 74, verse 1. Oh God, why have you cast us off forever? Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? So we are not to equate the pillar of smoke here with the pillar of cloud in Exodus. It's a completely different phrase and word. Uh, we see in Exodus 13, 22, he did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from his people. So what do we see here? Solomon is smoking mad because the bride has left him and is returned to the, and she's with the shepherd. All right. Now, look what the daughters of Jerusalem say. Behold his bed, which is Solomon's. And there are 60 men of war about it of the valiant of Israel. They all hold swords. Being expert in war, every man has his sword upon his thigh because of fear in the night. Solomon is putting all of them in jeopardy because Simon or Solomon is a man of the night. He's a man of darkness. Okay, he's a predator. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 5. You are all children of light and the children of day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. 
So here Solomon is putting his own men in danger. They're in fear just to fulfill his own desires. Okay? How many of you know, and you read it in uh, Judges and different stories, there are lions and bears out there. But Solomon does not love Jerusalem. He loves the daughters of Jerusalem, and they're seeing if any of the daughters are daughters of the night, and that's who he's looking for. We know in 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because it fear has torment. He that fears is not made perfect in love. So we see all of his people that are carrying his bed are all afraid. They're all in fear because this is not godly love. As a matter of fact, the daughters of Jerusalem continue to speak and look at what they say in verse 9 and 10. Why, King Solomon made himself a chariot of the wood of Lebanon. He made the pillars of silver, the bottom of gold, the covering of purple, the midst being paved with love for who? For the daughters of Jerusalem. It's not for Jerusalem. It's for the daughters of Jerusalem. That's all he cares about. Now, what's amazing is look at Amos chapter 6, verse 3 through 6. This portrays Solomon who's laying on his bed that everybody's carrying. Here he takes his bed out in the middle of the night. I'll tell you something. You who put far away the evil day, causing the rule of the violent to come near. Doesn't that sound like today? You who are resting on beds of ivory, stretched out on soft seats, feasting on the lambs from the flock. They're not feeding the lambs. They're feasting on the lambs. It sounds like a lot of our political leaders. And the young oxen from the cattle house, making foolish songs to the sound of corded instruments and designing for themselves instruments of music like David, drinking wine in basins, rubbing themselves with the best oils, but they have no grief for the destruction of Joseph. These are people that are only concerned for the best times for themselves. They don't care about what is going on in Israel. They don't care about what's going on with God's people. I mean, this is so plain to me. <clears throat> Look at Ezekiel 34, 10 through 12. This is what the Lord has said. He said, look, I'm against the keepers of the flock. Wow. I am going to search and see what they have done with my sheep and will let them be keepers of my sheep no longer, and the keepers will no longer get food for themselves. I'm going to take my sheep out of their mouths so they may not be food for them. For this is what the Lord has said. Truly I, even I, will go searching and looking for my sheep as the keeper goes looking for his flock when he's among his wandering sheep. So I will go looking for my sheep, and I will get them safely out of all the places where they've been sent wandering in the day of clouds in the black night. This is why Messiah came. He came to gather nothing but the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But look, how, look what the, God says to the shepherds that aren't feeding the flock. Now, what does the bride say? The bride is finally maturing, okay? And she says to the daughters of Jerusalem who just love King Solomon, she says in chapter 3, verse 11, You go forth, O you daughters of Zion, and behold King Solomon with the crown wherewith his mother crowned him in the day of his espoused souls. Not espoused soul, espoused souls. He buried a thousand ladies. And in the day of the gladness of his heart. In other words, seeing is saying to the daughters of Jerusalem, you can have Solomon, I've got the shepherd. But now what happens? Now the shepherd jumps in and look what he says now, because he's finally maturing. He says, behold, you are fair, my love. You are fair, and you have dove's eyes. Remember earlier, he said you have the eyes of a dove, and not like a hawk or an eagle. And he says, you have dove's eyes within your locks. Your hair is as a flock of goats that appear from Mount Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep that are even shorn which came up from the washing, where everyone bears twins, and none is barren among them. Your lips are like a thread of scarlet. Your speech is comely. Your temples are like a piece of pomegranate within your locks. Your neck is like the tower of David built for an armory. 
where on there hangs a thousand bucklers, all shields of mighty men. Your two breasts are like two young rolls that are twins, which feed among the lilies. He's actually feeding among the lilies. He's there helping. All right, could you imagine? Here he is. I'm going to give you a picture of what he just described. Here she is. Ta-da! Her nose is like the Tower of Lebanon. Her neck is like an army, you know. Her hair is like a flock of goats. <laughs> Honey dropping off her tongue. Now you know what she really looks like. All right, but with that said, get ready for next week. We're going to look at this in more detail. But I hope as I'm teaching this, you're getting a more real picture of what it's really trying to say because this is the one book that is so mistranslated, misspoke, taught on uh, throughout the church. But can you see what it's really about? It's all about the bride maturing, working the harvest. All she's been doing now is falling asleep, falling asleep, falling asleep. But there's going to come a point where the bride matures and that's where we're at prophetically right now. Prophetically. We are at the point where all of a sudden the, ma, uh, the bride is going to mature and we're going to want to get to work. Does that make sense? All right, let's stand and pray.